You're listening to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, aimed at helping photographers learn how to make the leap from amateur to pro. Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, a joint effort brought to you by PhotoFocus and Skip Cohen University. This is Shamir Young and I am joined by my tropical co-host, Skip Cohen. Whoa. Skip. In What's all up? these years, I've never been a tropical <laughs> co-host. But well, I gotta admit, it, weather. It was, well, it was in the low 60s, late, oh, high 50s this morning. And by noon, we were back into the 80s. So it's like, like I said, welcome tropical. to Florida in the spring. Hey, Florida we, compared I mean, to Michigan, yep. Well, I, are you still getting snow? Uh, not today. We did okay. a few days ago. <laughs> no, not today. <laughs> All right, everybody. That's the banter that goes on every podcast because she lives in Detroit and I live in Florida. or outside Detroit. Anyway, we got a great show today, Shamira. We sure do. Yes. Uh, in fact, I'm going to start out by repeating something I've said probably hundreds of times, and that's simply the best thing about this industry has virtually nothing to do with photography directly. It's all about the friendships that come out of everyone's love for the craft. Well, we've got one of my best buddies joining us today. We've got Steve Brazel, a.k.a. The Raz, if you listen to KCALFM in California, and he is in the house. But just being a well-respected radio personality just wasn't enough for him. So he's also an outstanding event photographer. He's an artist. And he's a host to one of the best podcasts in imaging, Behind the Shot TV. You'll find it on YouTube. Now, unfortunately, with the impact of the pandemic on conventions over the last couple years, we have not caught up live in a long time. But the fun of great friendships is that it hasn't changed, has not changed one bit the respect or appreciation I have for his skill set and especially our friendship. So we're going to talk about an industry we all love. We're going to talk what he's about what he's been doing through the challenges. We're going to hit on his thoughts about the future. And like any podcast like this, you never know what else is going to come up along the way. So here he is live, probably just back from his run to Del Taco. Hey, buddy, you welcome to. to Mind Your Own Business. You had, you I, had to do that. I had to put it in there. It was It was a necessity. I, there's no way I can live up to that introduction, so no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. But just for the audience, I can't tell you how many times I have caught him grabbing a bite at Del Taco. And we all have some of our favorite fast foods um, out there, and Del Taco is high on his list. Yes. So Del, Del Taco is a daily thing, and you know, wonder why? They have the most consistent fountain diet Coke is really the main reason that I go there. <laughs> there uh, you go. But yes, I agree with everything you said. I miss seeing you uh, live and in person. But you know, during the pandemic, we got to do your F sixty four lunch bunch together, and we did some stuff with Shamira together. And you guys are sending emojis without me knowing about <laughs> cats with sunglasses. So this is gonna be fun. That's, that, oh. that's it. By the way, speaking of fast food, if anybody hasn't checked it out, Arby's has a double secret menu item called Meat Mountain. And you have to ask for it specifically. It's a $10 sandwich with every piece of meat, whether it's chicken, ham, bacon, everything that they make all goes into one sandwich that's about, oh, six to eight inches high. So oh there it is. There's my contribution to the fast oh food goodness. world today. Well, now that my stomach is growling, yeah. Arby's did there not sponsor this episode, but good to know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, Steve, so, it's so get, cool to have you on. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So for the listeners, Steve, who may not know much about you, can you tell us about your, your background quickly, how you got into doing what you're doing today? Uh, yeah. And so that you know, I, you and I have discussed this before privately, but I used to live in Detroit. I worked mm -hmm. for uh, WCZY in Detroit for three years in the early 80s, and I miss Detroit. I love that town. I love the area, although you're not in Detroit proper. Uh, neither was I. I was actually in Farmington Hills and, and Royal Oak at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, so how I got started, this is one of those stories that is different from, I think, most people that photograph what I photograph. So I've been in radio for years and years, about 43 years I've been on, on the air in radio. I've been at the current radio station I'm at, KCAL-FM, since 1987. And when we had a child, like so many parents, our son ended up in high school doing marching band in high school, and we wanted photographs. 
So I went into, at the time, they're gone now, but at the time, a Ritz camera. And I looked at the guy behind the counter and I said, I need to take pictures of my son on a, on a football field, high school football field from up in the stands. What do I need? And he put a Canon at the time, a Canon XTI and whatever the Nikon equivalent was at the time. And the only reason I shoot Canon is because it felt better in my hand at that point. It was more comfortable. He put a 70 to 300 F35 to 5.6 and a 70 to 200 2.8 in front of me and said, you want this one, the 70 to 200? And I, my response to him was, but the camera's black and that lens is white. They don't match. <laughs> and <laughs> three, 300 is more than 200, not understanding variable aperture. And I, so I, I need the 300. Needless to say, that major mistake of buying absolutely the wrong lens for what I was doing uh, is what taught me photography and, and made me fall in love with low light because a, a high school football field is very dark. And I mean, comparatively, uh, especially when you're up in the stands, I'd be zoomed in on my son or zoomed out, perfect exposure. I'd zoom in on my son. The aperture would change. I didn't understand that at the time. My exposure would drop and I'd pull him up on the computer and be confused. That mistake of buying the wrong lens made me fall in love with the challenge of capturing moving action in extreme low light. At that point, I went to my boss at the radio station and said, look, in those days, it's not so much anymore. We get backstage for meet and greets at concerts. Is there any way we can get photo passes? His response was, I don't know, ask somebody. I said, well, if I ask somebody, they may need a business card and DJs don't have business cards. He said, I'll email you the logo, make your own. <laughs> I got the logo. I made my business card at a quick, you know, print place. And two weeks later was at my first ever concert, which was Heart and Def Leppard at the Universal Amphitheater in Los Angeles. That will not happen to almost anybody. You'll start shooting no name bands, local bands and nightclubs. But the fact that I was traditional, quote unquote, media, radio, broadcast radio. Uh, made a huge difference in getting me started in what I refer to affectionately as low light action photography. And to this day, it is something I love doing. Wow. Just curious, what was the first image you ever got paid for? Or event um, or concert? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, the first image I probably ever got paid for was probably Vincente Fernandez, who's a uh, very, very, I just photographed him actually about a month ago too. Um, a very, very well-known, it might've been, might've been Vincente. It could have been a comedian too. Uh, uh, but he's a well-known uh, uh, South American artist, plays accordion, banda type music. And it was for a casino that I was the house photographer. I'd been hired as a house photographer for a local casino. And that's where it started. You know, you're, you were talking about your son's games. I was at my high school alma mater going back about, this is probably about 10 years ago. And Sheila and I were out in Ohio and we were there on a Friday night. We were able to go to a Friday night game and I was so excited. And I looked out on the sideline and there's a woman absolutely loaded with gear and I went out and introduced myself. She's shooting with Canon, and she's got she's got a 600 millimeter on this camera. Um, and I went out and in introduced myself, um, thinking this must be the high school photo teacher. And she was just a mom, mm. and she wanted to get great, get great pictures of her son. And truthfully, that lens was way more than what she needed to be on the sideline for the game. But she had that that bazooka in front of her and she probably owned most of what Canon makes. So, and, and I will say, you know, what you just said is so true about, you know, high school parents, uh, in my case, marching band or a football parent or a soccer parent or whatever is, I think a lot of people that I know at least got started in photography because they had children that they wanted to photograph but they just were geeky enough, I think, to not want to just sit in the stands with a, at the time, you know, a point and shoot camera that they really wanted to get pictures of their children. And in many cases, I think 
that turns into people going, you know what, I want to do this for a living. And I think that's awesome. I, you know, however you get there, I have an absolute to this day, I have an absolute love of photography and specifically for, for me, for shooting, I love all photography, which is why I love doing the podcast that I do. But for me specifically, the amazing challenge of low light action photography is something I think everybody should try once. If if you're a, a landscape nature photographer, go to a nightclub and try shooting a band. It will change the way you shoot what you really shoot. Absolutely. Wow. Talk about a challenge. Uh, well, speaking of challenges and and things you were doing then to learn photography, I'm curious about, this has been a long dry spell for everybody. What are some of the things you've been doing to keep in touch with that passion for imaging through the last couple of years. Now, things are obviously getting better now, but both Shamer and I have talked a lot about, you know, the business slowly coming back. But what you what did you do to keep busy over the last couple of years? And and stay focused. Great, that is absolutely such a great question. And it's interesting because I, I don't know about you guys, but most photographers that I know they, I don't want to say that they shoot more than one thing for a living, but they shoot more than one thing, right? Most wedding photographers that I know also love just going out and shooting landscapes or shooting fine art, or I have music photographer friends that also photograph book covers. For me, and, and I don't know if it's something, it, it's funny, I go back and forth whether or not I'm I'm saying this proudly or I'm saying this sheepishly. Really, all I love shooting is live music and, and the stuff related to it, like behind the scenes stuff on stage, off stage, dressing, whatever, meet and greets, um, trade shots, uh, promo shots, stuff like that. Almost all that I love to photograph relates to a concert in some way. So for me, during the downtime, it wasn't, hey, let's go to Yosemite and set up a tripod and do some long exposure. That didn't that doesn't work for my brain. And what I found myself really doing was, and studying is probably the wrong word, but I'm going to use it anyway. I, I found myself studying. I don't mean researching and reading a ton of, you know, classic photography books and, and learning the zone system and stuff like that. It's just absorbing as much as I can from as many different places as I can, whether that be guests on my podcast, which almost none of them shoot what I shoot, but I would argue I learn more from the people who don't photograph the same subject as me. Uh, it, it's either it's either doing that, reading articles. I tend to you know go there more than books. I did get a couple of books though that I love. Don Komarechka's you know uh, latest book. Um, I just got Joe McNally's latest book. Um, it you know it could be that type of thing. It could be watching YouTube videos. So a lot of it conceptual. Um, fed my fed my creative appetite is that a a way to word it i guess absolutely That's, yeah 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 by the way you just hit on two books that i'm going to remind everybody um i don't know what everybody has on their bookshelf but every photographer and i just got joe mcnally's book too in fact now i'm chasing him to sign it um i just got joe's and don Komarechka's book on macro photography called the universe at our feet is the finest macro resource book i think i have ever seen it's just phenomenal those are two books that everybody should have somewhere in their in their photo library yeah i agree i've got two of don's books sitting behind me i've got joe's book sitting behind me and uh you know, it's interesting how they're different approaches. One of them, Don's, is is like an encyclopedia of macro photography. Mm -hmm. I said that to him once and he denied it, but I, I must stay with <laughs> him. And then, because Don and I do a photo critique show through through my podcast, Behind the Shot, we do a monthly photo critique as well uh, that we stream on YouTube. But Joe's book is one of the most educational books, I think, out there, and yet in many ways, I don't know that it's written as an educational book as much as the stories of his career that you learn a ton from. Yeah, just great resources. 
Very cool. And so, Steve, I love that you mentioned that you were create, you were feeding your creative appetite uh, while we were dealing with everything being shut down. And so, fast forward to today, what does your business look like now that you're able to get back into event photography? Are you doing things the same? Has anything changed? Uh, again, great question. I'm doing everything kind of what I did before, mm-hmm. but the industry itself has changed. So when the world stopped ending, <laughs> there was a event. So there was a venue I was the house photographer for for a couple of years, and they closed their showroom, which it was a, a local casino. And it was a very nice showroom, but it was basically a flat, giant square room. It was their bingo room as well. They had a wonderful stage, state of the art sound system, but it was not, you know, a, a, an arena type you know, theater type event. And they closed it, modified the room, built some restaurants in there, completely remodeled the the casino. And they ended up building their own new showroom that in fact should be opening anytime soon. 2016, that room closed. And at that point I started doing a lot of, of uh, stuff, not only for the radio station, but for live nation, people like that. When the world stopped ending and the pandemic kind of started to move to where concerts could open again. There was a local venue here in Southern California, an arena, Toyota Arena, that I wanted to be the house photographer for. And I'd asked and pitched it a million times, but they had people. Uh, We do a lot with them through the radio station. And I saw them post, and this is one of the things, this this is, it goes back to your other question. What was I doing? I was watching things. When I say feeding my creative appetite, I, I was absorbing things everywhere. And I just happened to see that the arena put a now hiring story on Instagram. Now they were hiring, you know, ticket takers, bartenders, security, you know, whatever. Right. But I immediately emailed my contact there that I get photo passes through and said, Hey, it looks like you guys are reopening for shows. If you need a photographer, I just wanted to say again, I'd love to work with you. And in my head, I'm thinking, you know, they've, they've already got people they dealt with before, but I don't know that those people didn't move, didn't stop photography after the pan. I don't know. So I'm just, you ask, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? Fire me? Um, so I reached out and I got an email back from somebody else saying this person due to the pandemic isn't coming back until September, but strangely enough, we do need photographers. Let's talk. I am now and have been for a year. That, that was last summer. Uh, the house photographer at this arena, and I love it. Uh, I still do some stuff for Live Nation here and there. Um, Hopefully I'll shoot for that other casino when their showroom opens. What's interesting is just the way the industry as a whole has changed. So imagine if you would, you know, uh, this is kind of unlike weddings, right? People at weddings make kind of their own decisions. They either have a photographer or not. They decide on masks or vaccinations or not. In the concert world at large, there's exceptions, but at large, most of the tours live in a bubble because if you think about it, you know, I'll just throw a, a, a band out there. Um, you know, if, if um, Luke Combs is touring and Luke Combs gets COVID, it's not Luke Combs that loses work. His entire crew, however many 18 wheelers, however many buses, all of it gone, they're all out of a job. So, because of that, the bands themselves live in a very tightly controlled bubble often, which means shows that would have been a normal concert shoot. So the normal standard rule in concerts, uh, I'm assuming you both have been to concerts and listeners have at a concert. If you imagine you get there early and you get in the front row and you're up against the metal barricade, usually you're not up against the stage. So you're up against a metal barricade And then there's a whatever five, three, two foot gap where security stands to catch crowd surfers or catch people trying to climb up on the stage. And then there's the stage. Well, that area where security is, is called the photo pit. And we normally shoot the first three songs from that photo pit. Well, with COVID, a lot of artists don't want people that close. They'll either say you have to have a mask on if you're going to be in the photo pit. Or what a lot of them are just doing is saying, you know what, no photographers in the photo pit, you have to photograph from the soundboard, what's called front of house. So if you picture an arena, the guy mixing the house sound is three quarters of the way back the arena floor. And we have to shoot from there. 
with, you know, a 400 or a 600 millimeter lens. That's changed. A lot of acts that would have been from the pit where you get good close shots are now farther back. The other thing that's changed is the behind the scenes stuff. So for the arena, I take a trade shot every show where the general manager of the arena gets a photo taken backstage with the artist. And <clears throat> those pictures go into trade magazines like Polestar. Well, either some of the artists don't want to do a trade shot because of COVID. They don't want to be around people. Or they've all got masks on, at which point the shot is arguably somewhat useless because a lot of times you can't even tell who it is. Um, you know, just a lot of that around the act of working. The job is still there. The acts related to the job have changed greatly post COVID uh, because of the danger of losing an entire tour. If one person gets sick. That is wow. such a good point. That puts such a different perspective on it for those of us that are absolutely outside um, you and all your counterparts. Yeah. Yeah. And COVID, I, I will say that, Every industry was hit by close, you know, close downs. Um, you know, the, I think the first thing that pops to mind actually to me is the restaurant industry. Bartenders didn't have second jobs. A lot of them waiters mm. and waitresses didn't have, uh, you know, hostess people didn't have second jobs. Uh, so when a restaurant closed, the, the waiter or waitress that worked four days a week doing that, maybe while in college, didn't have a backup plan. The same exists in the music industry where there are people like me that work in radio and I do photography for the radio station. I also do stuff for venues or man, you know, promotion companies. But a lot of the people that I know tour photographers that tour with an artist lost their livelihood. They, they, they can't also shoot weddings easily because for three months at a time they're on tour and they don't know when. So, it hit the industry very, very hard with people losing work. Now that it's come back and concerts are coming back with an absolute vengeance, everybody's happy to be back. And it, it, you and I, we were talking kind of in the green room before we started recording how it's really changed that what I'm seeing now is people that are amazing creatives that fed that creative appetite during the downtime are now suddenly in a lab in a way. <laughs> Right. They're going out and shooting shows and experimenting. And some of it works and some of it doesn't. But my gosh, it's so cool to watch people play. Right. Professionals that do this for a living and know what the money shot is and know what the people want. And they get those. They get those safe shots first. And then they're kind of playing again. I, I think it's awesome to watch. So when you say experimenting, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Is Are they experimenting with the composition of their shots or or the creative aspects? Or I guess, what, what exactly do you mean? Fantastic question, actually. Um, I think it's different for every person. Like mm -hmm. before the pandemic hit, I was seeing a lot of music photographers use, you know, elements like crystals in front of their lenses. Ah. So they would, as they're taking a picture, they'd hold up, you know, what is effectively a prism up that would either blur or, or you know, disperse the light or something, separate the colors, um, create a blur effect around the artist, something like that. And there's a number of pre-purchased products you can buy that attach to the front of your lens. Some of them just hold them up. But I'm also seeing people who's, who I've known for years, I'm seeing kind of what you alluded to, Shamir, and that is their style is changing. Mm -hmm. Whether it be compositionally, they're shooting tighter. They're shooting looser. They're shooting. It, it's the old landscape thing, right? Uh, or, or it's the old um, Robin Williams movie. What was it? The Dead Poet Society, right? <laughs> Stand up on the desk and look at the world from a different angle, mm -hmm. yep. right? It's that where you see people in landscape or in video say, shoot wide, shoot tight, shoot medium. I'm seeing people choose a different angle position a subject differently, drag a shutter differently in areas where, in, in genres where generally you want, you know, when you have a, a person jumping in the air at a concert, you want frozen. You want mm -hmm. a tight, crisp hair whip where the eye is sharp and a little bit of blur, that's concert photography, whatever. 
I'm seeing people do extreme motion blurs or like one of my things is I love to drag the shutter on a drummer. Freezing a drummer with his sticks in the air is great. But it, in some ways, it's like photographing auto racing, right? If you photograph a car racing around a track and you freeze the rims, the car's parked. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. But if you point. see a little bit of blur in the rims, you still want the driver sharp, but it's like an airplane, right? If you, I was talking to Moose Peterson about this once. It, on an airplane, if the propeller is frozen, is it a glider? I don't know. So having a little bit of motion blur in a drumstick for me tells more of the story. Mm. I'm seeing people strangely to me, because it's not the way my brain works, but I like it, I experiment with exposure. Like pictures where I look at them and go, oh, my God, that's heavily underexposed. Or is it just moody? Right. I mean, wow. it's open to interpretation. To me, it's underexposed or to me, it's radically blown out. Or is it a style they're going for to experiment? And I'm seeing some people an entire shoot is this dark, moody, underexposed feel. It's clearly in intentional. And again, sometimes I personally think it works or doesn't. They may have a different opinion. I just love seeing people play. Oh, that is so cool. You know, one of, one of the things that the pandemic, I want to say gave everybody, actually forced every artist to do, um, was, and sadly, some of them just gave up and went back to God knows what, real estate, whatever, whatever they had in their back pocket to earn a living. And I totally understand that. But those that have stuck it out have become more diverse. I think we've got one of the most diversified collection of artists the industry's ever had because in the middle of lockdown and you're hunkered down and I, I love not not having to use those two words anymore I never used them before the pandemic and it, it's so nice that they don't come up very often now they had to look for other things to do so macro became very big in fact you know you mentioned Don Kamarechka before I mean Don the friendship that Don and I have came out of something that we were both doing for Panasonic at the time years ago, but it's grown so much and his outlook on panoramic on panoramic on macro photography just has been such an influence. The same with um, another friend that we share, Lizzie Gadd. Um, she's the queen of selfies, but she's tied in landscape together and a couple of the areas that everybody could go do um, macro, you could find things around the house, you could find flowers, you could find snowflakes. I mean, there are all kinds of things you could do. And landscape, you could be out on your own and maintain social distancing. Wildlife became big. And I'm seeing so many artists today that are really better than they were two years ago because of, I mean, you mentioned before, if you're a landscape photographer, go shoot a nightclub. It's it's pushing that edge of the envelope that's made them more diverse and given them a better understanding of the craft. You 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 said so much there that I want to unpack. I'm literally taking notes as you're talking. Oh, stop it. I'm dead serious. <laughs> I literally it. wrote down diversified in real estate because I wanted to remember to, to to touch on something you just said. And that is some photographers during the pandemic, like some restaurants had to close. Okay, that may be financial. They didn't have enough resources and runway ahead of them to stay open. But a lot of creatives gave up and went to plan B, at which point I would humbly argue, were you really a creative in the first place or was it just something that you enjoyed doing and happened to make money at? Because the people that I know that are true lovers of a craft, not an art, but a craft, right? Um, found ways to improve themselves. You and I talked about this on F64 Lunch Bunch with every guest that we had. How yeah. do you how do you improve your skill set right now while you're not working so that when the pandemic is over and the world is back alive, you've got actually a head start on those that were sleeping, right? Those people who went to real estate may be better off there. I don't know. But, you know, oh, my gosh, you mentioned Lizzie Gad. 
people if you do not know Lizzie Gad. It, I, uh, calling it a selfie is such a disservice <laughs> in a way because it is. Uh, Lizzie Gad is is just such a freaking artist. And Don Komarechka is, I would argue, the best in the field at what he does. I, I just think it's so important that people people look outside what they do. I learned <clears throat> I learned about layering by talking to landscape photographers. I use layering in my imaging all the time, and I was actually using it before then. I just it was in my head and I saw it that way, but I didn't realize what I was the way I was using it as a structural composition component until I really started talking to landscape photographers seriously about, you know, layering in landscape photography and in in videography and storytelling. At which point, even though I was kind of inherently doing it anyway, now that I'm aware of it and thinking about it, I can use that tool to an advantage, right? Wedding photography and the ability to shoot wide but also get detail, which every wedding photographer has to take ring shots and bouquet shots and shoe shots at the same time that they're taking dancing, right? Mm -hmm. Doing, looking at what other people are doing, I believe in other genres and talking to fans of photography as a whole um, will change the way you shoot whatever you shoot. I just had uh, Larry, your, our, our mutual friend Larry from Platypod on. He's the current guest actually on, the, on, on my podcast. And we talked about his new products, his Platypod Extreme and stuff, but we also talked, and his Platyball, but we, we dove into choosing black and white. And I already knew what we were going to talk about before, before he came on the show, right? We had talked about it. Okay, let's talk about you know why you would choose black and white over color and yada, yada, yada. And Larry suddenly starts going into Ansel Adams and the zone system and the dark room and distractions and graphical elements that is just such a refreshing conversation to have whether or not you, yes, you may shoot the shot in color and change it to black and white later just because you think it works better. Okay, cool. But if while you're thinking it works better, you can also say to yourself, what am I gaining from the black and white here? What is it doing for me that I didn't think about? I would posit, since in, in, in essence this podcast here is also touching on the business side of things, understanding those types of, of things, not just, hey, that looks better in black and white than color, but it looks better because it helps you sell it, helps you deal, talk to a client, helps you better explain everything that you do therefore have a more successful business wow I cannot begin to tell you how much I wish this were a longer podcast <laughs> same here uh, I mean there is so much you just hit on uh, and in fact I just had Lizzie Gad and Chris Andrus, um, her boyfriend, here for two nights before their podcast last week. And they flew in. I picked them up at the airport. You don't really appreciate how brilliant they both are until you actually talk to them about their passion for the craft. And, and that's a piece that maybe it's another podcast, but that's a piece of what I think we're still missing is that is that live personal time that we get when we are at a convention when you get out to dinner I always say never eat a meal alone when you're at a convention take the time to get to know another photographer that's there find other people to talk to that and that was, may be the best tip yeah. ever by the way well it's it it was just so incredible being able to talk to them and I have one of Lizzie's prints that Sheila and I loved and bought and it's hanging in our dining room um, a year ago but when you get her and Chris together and they both start to talk about their love for the outdoors their love for landscaping their love for, for detail landscaping I'm making them sound like they own a nursery um, for landscape photography it that's that piece that I'm looking forward to coming back as as things start to get back to a more more normalcy more conventions coming up 
and just being able to be with people. So, Tamara, you need to you need to wrap this up. You know, you're, I know. You're I want to let it go here. on. I know. I know. This is so great. Well, oh. let's, what do you think? You want to hit him with with our favorite close? Yeah, let's let's do it. Our favorite final question. Um, and S- Steve, you know, as you were talking, I actually scribbled down on my note pa- my note page here. Uh, holistic approach. I love how you were, uh, you know, describing with the black and white photography and thinking through the process and asking why, and then incorporating sales. And it's this whole holistic approach that that I think could be beneficial for a lot of photographers. And it's interesting because a lot of us are kind of re-examining why we do what we do and how we do how we do what we do as things open back up. And so now is the perfect time, the perfect time for some innovation. And uh, so our favorite final question, which it's a loaded question, especially post pandemic. Uh, what advice would you give for photographers who are just starting out today and kind of need a kick in the pants to get started? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, that's really a twofold question because there's photographers just starting out today and need a kick in the pants to be creative and shoot and become better or to open, you know, something that can be a profit center for them to make a living. Mm -hmm. Uh, For me, for photographers just shooting out, uh, just shooting out, what does that even mean, Steve? (laughs) Just start. (laughs) Just starting out. I know what you meant. Wow. Okay. Um, It's the Diet Coke. That's what's doing it. Uh, (laughs) For those photographers that are just starting out, this is going to sound strange, but put yourself at a disadvantage. So there was a – somebody mentioned to me one time an exercise that they gave photography students. And I'm I'm not saying go do this exercise, but I'm saying think about it conceptually, right? And the, the idea was go to a parking lot, an empty parking lot. And try to make 10 great pictures. Mm. The idea being that you're handicapped. You're in a parking lot that's basically nothing but asphalt and white lines and maybe parking stops, right? What can you see? Learn to see the light. Learn to see the the shapes, the, the moment. Learn to figure out, is there a wide shot? Is there a tight shot? But more than anything, it's the conceptual challenge. You know, the the, the flip side of that is, you know, go photograph a concert with nothing but a 51.8, right? Uh, or in my case, when I started, put on the wrong lens. Literally put on something you know is not the right lens. Variable aperture in concert photography makes it exceedingly more difficult. You're shooting extreme low light with extreme fast action. So the act of zooming if it also requires you to zoom and change exposure and then zooming back out, change exposure again because your aperture changed, those make everything much more difficult, which will, all of this will help you better understand the tools that you, that's all they are. They're tools, right? They'll help you better understand the tools that you have in your hands so that you can do things mindlessly so that you can pick up a camera and if a singer suddenly sticks their face, you know, a foot from me, or the example I always use is if I'm shooting an outdoor festival, there are times, depending on the sun at two o'clock in the afternoon, where the singer is standing in full shade of the overhang of the stage. And all they do is lean their face forward. And it's a three stop exposure difference because their face suddenly hit the sun, but the the rest of their body is still in full shade. Being able to adjust to things like that quickly means knowing your gear. So that's number one. As far as the business side of it, and what I would tell people to make money is stop thinking of your business on price. Just stop. Just stop, stop, stop. There are people in every price range out there. I don't care. I don't care if you own a computer store. There's people out there selling Macs. An Apple at an Apple store that are way more than the $500 PC that you're selling at a small computer store. I've told this story before, so Skip may have heard this, but I had a friend who owned a computer store. Like he built custom PCs and repaired and stuff like that. And I went in to say hi to him once, and he was showing a guy a computer, and the guy said, "How much is it?" And he said, "It's you know, it's 550." And the guy goes, "Okay, I'll take it." And literally after that sentence. My friend that owned the computer store goes, I'll do it for five. Oh. 
because in his head, he needed to go cheaper. Even the guy said, just said he would buy it. Wow. But everything was, oh, the customer only cares about the price. No, as a business person, your job is to be able to explain and justify why you charge what you charge. They may still walk away. That's okay. You have to be able to justify, I, I want this amount of money for this task. Here's why it's worth it to you. My pictures are going to last for you for a long time in marketing or whatever. It's not just a shot today. You're going to utilize these over and over. Whatever it is, you need to justify your rate uh, and sell that, not just lower the rate. Great advice. Couldn't have asked for a better answer. Wow. And part one of your answer, put yourself as at a dis, at a disadvantage. I don't know if we've ever had anyone suggest that. I think that nope. is the coolest thing. Really. That is just... I have, I, I have a friend who shot an entire music festival on purpose. He had full access on stage and everything. Um, also had his own podcast, uh, Matthias Hombauer. And he used to put on a manual focus lens. Ooh. Now, I couldn't tell you... <laughs> I could have turned that thing all day long, and when I think it's in focus, I don't know. Uh -oh. It wouldn't have worked for me. But, hey, if that's your thing, put on a manual focus lens. Do something, you know, to challenge it. Yeah. Right on. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And good stuff. Very good stuff. Outstanding. Outstanding. Steve, I do want to make sure and ask, where can folks check you out online? Uh, my portfolio is stevebrazel.com. It's spelled like the country Brazil, but there's two L's. So it's Brazel, actually. Uh, SteveBrazel.com. I'm Steve Brazel on Twitter. I'm Steve Brazel on Instagram. Steve Brazel Photography still exists on Facebook, but I'm never there. I've abandoned Facebook pretty much. And then the podcast is BehindTheShot.TV. And it's BehindTheShotTV on Instagram and BehindTheShotTV on Twitter and Facebook. Excellent. We will make sure and include those in the show notes. And, and I'm most active on Twitter, actually, so that's Skip, where can folks find you? It's always the same answer. I'm Skip Cohen on Twitter. I'm Skip Cohen on Facebook. Um, everything I write is at skipcohenuniversity.com. And we always like to remind everybody that if you've got any feedback, if you've got any guests you'd like to have us have on, or uh, topics you'd like to make sure we cover, um, send an email to me at skip at M-E-I and the number 500.com. And as I always ask the same question, Shamira, where do they go to find you? Yes, folks can send me an email at Shamira at photofocus.com. That's my first name, C-H-A-M-I-R-A at photofocus.com. We love getting questions, ideas, even suggestions for future guests. And by the way, if you are a photographer listening and you think that you'd like to nominate yourself for the show, then by all means, hit us up. We do get the occasional email from people saying that they'd like to be on the show, and we absolutely love getting those emails. And uh, by the way, if I may interject, absolutely. if you guys need recommendations, I can definitely recommend people to you. Oh, fantastic. Uh, with, without a problem, I can do that. And I should have also mentioned I'm on YouTube, too, at Behind the Shot. <laughs> That works. Excellent. That absolutely works. Yeah, Steve, we're going to have to hit you up for some. Any, I know any suggestions coming from you would be great suggestions. So... And we're always looking for awesome new guests on the show. And speaking of awesome, Steve, you were very awesome. In case Boy, you did didn't you, know. Yeah, you nailed it with so many good things for people to think about today. Lots yeah. of great insight. Thank you. The pleasure the pleasure was all mine. I love this. Great stuff. And wonderful stuff. And we want to thank our listeners for joining us as well. Please tell your friends about this podcast, especially if they have the burning desire to improve their photography business. Now that things are opening back up. We look forward to having you all with us next time on the Mind Your Own Business podcast, brought to you by Photo Focus and Skip Cohen University. 